right, guys, we are here with Max Hansen. What's going on, bud? Uh, not much, man. I'm just kind of slowly getting through this two-week isolation thing because I just got back from Pans, right? So uh, they're kind of oh. way more serious about it this time. Like, uh, I remember when I got back from Texas, I think it was in July or August or something, they, were, they didn't really, like, crack down on it. But now, like, they'll – They'll be like calling me and I have to call them every day. They even send me an email saying I could get like fined up to a million dollars. So it's like, <laughs> it's like, that's like they said a million dollars, like Dr. Evil style, one million dollars dollars, right? It's like it's kind of crazy and it's making me like a bit par- paranoid, but I don't know, man. It's it is what it is. Well, wow. as of right now, unfortunately, they have to fine you up to one million dollars to uh, pay back one of our biggest sponsors for me and Aaron this year, CERB. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah, that, that's what I was joking with my friends. Like, I'm basically going to be funding the CERB here, man. Like, <laughs> it's really weird. They're they're being like totalitarian with it a little bit, but I get it. I get it. Like, I was in the, I was at Pans, right? Hundreds of competitors, people walking around with no masks on, and. You know, you know how it is, bro. You know how it is. How was the how how was the experience like going down there? It was in Florida, right? It was in Orlando. Oh uh, no, uh, the pans this year is uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, they went to Atlanta. Okay, how yeah, are the, yeah. how are the restrictions compared? Because you went to Texas earlier this year, and then you went to Atlanta. Like, was there a difference between the two? Um, oh. What's the difference between there and then, of course, here in like Toronto, the GTA, and then you're from Windsor. Like, what are the differences between all those areas? Yeah, so when I went to Texas, it was uh, it was a bit of a like a breath of fresh air because their restrictions are very very limited. Basically, the only thing they were really like emphasizing was just like wearing masks in restaurants. But other than that, man, it was like it was like it was pre-COVID times. It was it was, it was really nice for a little bit. Like I even went to a tent planet in Austin, where uh, Kyle Bain is training. Like a lot of good guys there. Like the gym was packed. Like this gym is really, really big. And there's just so many people on the mats and the restrictions are so limited, but in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, yeah, they were definitely like more on top of it. And the Abby Jeff was like, they had cops walking around, like basically like enforcing people with masks, like really trying to get on top of it. Just so I think it's just so they could actually like run the event without getting like the authorities shutting it down, which I get. But Texas was like, it was like, freedom city there like yeehaw, totally yeehaw there. guns guns freedom <laughs> yeah it was everything i expected about texas man great state though like great city austin texas yeah no, i've been to texas a couple times like it's a pretty neat cool place oh i didn't know you went where'd you go in texas i went to san antonio san antonio was a great spot and then we were we did a lot of like touring around that area which is awesome but again, like San Antonio's got the like the river walk. It's got like almost like picture like city of Toronto and then a level belief beneath it. They got the river and then you got the river walk, which is pretty cool. Now, man, that's yeah, pretty, but... that's pretty neat. Uh, what's um, and then you will let, let's introduce our guest officially. <laughs> yeah. And then I think we need to do some ad reads. So, uh, Max, tell the world uh, who you are. What uh, I believe you just got a silver medal at Pans. Yeah, silver medal. Uh, unfortunately, not the goal, but I, I mean, I can't be not happy with the silver medal. But my name is Max Million Hansen. I'm a jiu-jitsu competitor trying to be a pro submission grappler during these times of COVID, man. That's my intro. <laughs> there you go. Let's, let's do some ad right. reads first. So, uh, this is... Uh, we're going to do a couple ad reads real quick, Max. So our first Sorry. official sponsor, I'm not wearing their t-shirt right now, but uh, it is Project X Guard. We're working with Raul Chavez to help spread the, the love and good vibes of Brazilian jiu-jitsu to the at-risk communities. So if you know any at-risk youth, it doesn't have to necessarily be in the GTA, but it can be somebody like in Windsor that you feel could help to you know improve their lives through the you know training jiu-jitsu and helping them out uh raul chavez or project x guard on instagram you can reach out to them you can also reach out to us on the choking hazard podcast page and then uh max i gotta ask you what time i this is this is my own ad read so aaron buckle up get ready he he likes my ad reads so hey max what time was your flight uh to to uh down to texas when you went in july and what time was it in atlanta what time was your flight where did you fly uh, out of i think it was like 11 a.m 
It was 11 a.m.? Well, you know what? You should have left at 420 because <laughs> Spirit Leaf Waterdown would have had your back. <laughs> Located at, Aaron, what is their address? 64 Hamilton Street in Waterdown. In Waterdown, Ontario. They have all your CBD needs. They have all your THC needs. They have edibles, gummies, candies, more chocolate than the entire country of Germany combined. <laughs> King Kong ain't got shit on Spirit Leaf Waterdown. It's located at 64th Street, 64 Hamilton Street, Waterdown, Ontario. Shout out to Alex Tang and his team. He's got all the hookups that you need. So this is an in-store promotion. You're going to go in. You're going to show them that you're a follower of the Choking Hazard podcast page. There's a specific post that we have. You're going to show them a promo code, which is CH Podcast 10. That is CH Podcast 10. You show them, you show the cashier when you check out, you get 10% off all of your CBD, THC, and marijuana needs. Spirit Leaf Water Down, located at Aaron, one more time 64 Hamilton Street, Water Down, Ontario. Write that down. I'm going to keep, we're going to hammer that in through the entire uh, podcast that we're doing. Mike, the problem is if he had gotten off the plane in Atlanta or in Texas, he would have gotten nailed by uh, the drug squad for sure. Because I don't even think it's legal in those states yet. It's legal in some, it, it's state to state. Not in Texas. Federally. I know it's not in Texas. Not no. in Texas. <laughs> Pretty much everything else is yeah. legal in Texas. <laughs> yeah. that, was, that was the one bad thing. The one bad thing about Texas. It's just pretty crazy because you think about like all the stuff that Texas allows and that's the one yeah. thing. It's like marijuana is like a big no-no. <laughs> it's weird now going to the States because like we've had it legal for a while now. So you like you go to the States and you're like, oh yeah, it's like it's like super illegal here. Like in Georgia, they were like like super, super illegal. Like in Texas, mm -hmm. I feel like it was like almost on the verge of like being legalized, but like you forget that, right? It's kind of crazy to think about. Yeah. If you go to California, if you go to Oregon or like you yeah. know, Colorado, you're good. Right. But if you go to like these other places, these high Republican states, uh, good luck. <laughs> it's, it's so weird because like you go to Oregon and basically it's just like any drug goes and then you can go to like Montana right next door and then it, it's illegal. So it's, it's weird how the U S works or you have like California, which is a very, you know, liberal pro marijuana state and then you can go somewhere else right next door and that's not america man america guns freedom yeah mm -hmm. so so how many years you've been trying to do like international competition now for me like in jiu-jitsu specifically yeah uh so i'd say well i started jiu-jitsu around seven and a half years ago we're coming up on eight my goal originally was like uh, to go into MMA and I had like my, I had like two amateur MMA fights, one kickboxing smoker. And like, it, it wasn't until like I started training in, um, in like Toledo, Ohio with like Dante Leo and all those guys and seeing like professional jujitsu where I started to like actually believe that making a career in jujitsu is possible because before like, you know, in Canada, there's very like limited talent. You have to basically go to Toronto or Montreal and there isn't like a lot of other places where you can get serious pro training. So when I was finally like exposed to that about like a year and a half ago, that's when I, I really uh, like bunkered down and tried to focus just on jujitsu. So not about right. like the brain damage from MMA, like, especially like uh, I remember I saw that fight with like Michael Venom Page and Cyborg. You remember that like flying knee and the extra, yeah, 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 yeah. the dude's skull is just caved in. I'm like, man, fuck MMA. Like <laughs> this dude for sure. Like, that's crazy. Like, dented me and, forehead. Me and Aaron had uh, MMA aspirations way back in the day. Aaron had one full amateur fight. He retired 1-0, and oh, and I was actually going to do one, like, years and years ago, and then it fell through, and then I'm just like, yeah, you know what? Maybe this MMA stuff, I kind of don't want brain damage. I've already, like, messed yeah. up my nose. I've probably messed up other things as well. So, like, yeah. do, I, do I really want to get punched in the face and – not yeah, remember, you might get up with some like killer too, and that's like their whole life. You know what I mean? Like they're trying to get in the UFC, and then you're just you know you know you want to try out an amateur fight, and then you get loaded up with this guy who's just throwing flying knees at you, and you have no idea what's going on. So, mm -hmm. 
But if you do get that one fight, go one and no and retire. Like that's a good strategy. Like I did the two and no thing, retired, un- retire undefeated. That's the goal. Story to do it. Top. Story to do it. Go right on top. Call it a day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, the one thing too is like, like especially like with like MMA or just sparring in general, you can't train light. As much as people say, oh, yeah, we're just training light, it yeah. never works that way. Like you're always right. going home with like huge bumps and bruises. Whereas like jiu-jitsu, you can you can train hard and you can feel pretty good the next day. Yeah, exactly. And, and even with like, it's what you're saying with striking. Uh, when you're preparing for a fight, like you have to spar hard. Like, it's just like, I feel like that's the reality. Like you have to spar hard and sometimes the damage you take in the camps is going to be way more than the fights. Let's say like you finish the fight in two minutes. Well, man, if you had like an eight week camp sparring absolute monsters, like guys who are beating you up every day in the gym, like that adds up very quickly. Whereas mm-hmm. with jujitsu, it's what you're saying. Like, like you can train jujitsu every day. You could do it multiple times a day. It's like, it's not like striking, right? Like you can drill techniques you can flow roll, you can do positionals. Like it doesn't even have to be like full on sparring with light training and jujitsu. It's like, it's way more effective in my opinion than like light training and striking. But I'm no, I'm no striker, right? So I'm not an expert. Like I don't want to speak for the strikers. So yeah, yeah, no, for sure. But like, I, I know what you're, I feel what you're saying though. Like, and especially as like a professional athlete like yourself, you're training multiple times a day you're going to need to have those rules in. You can recover faster. Is that what you, yeah. that's what you need. Yeah, exactly. How yeah, did you, so uh, Max, how did you get involved in like, you know, jujitsu and MMA? Like where did all that come from? Like, where did you start up? Uh, okay. So I've been with my home gym to come to jujitsu for like my entire life. I remember I, I tried it out when I was like 12 years old uh like much younger like a long time ago and I, like I wasn't really into it and I kind of like just moved on to football I was just, like telling myself I was going to be a football player for some reason like but like I realized real fast like that ain't happening <laughs> so once I stopped playing football around like the 10th grade my parents basically uh they made it so like I have to do at least one sport right I have to do one sport I have to have like something to stay active in and stay in shape like it doesn't have to be like super dedicated or You know, it doesn't have to be my whole life. Just one sport while I'm in school just to maintain fitness. And I decided to pick jiu-jitsu, honestly. Just, uh, I've always had, like, an interest in martial arts. Like, I remember I was younger. I really liked that show Avatar, Last Airbender. I was like, I figured, like, some traditional martial arts. So, eventually, like, from Googling, I found out jiu-jitsu is the most effective martial art. And to come to jiu-jitsu, super close by my house. And here we are today. Excellent. So, um... So how long have you been like trying to do like competitive training now, like since day one, or is it kind of like waited a couple of years and then you got the tra- uh, competitive? Uh, it, it's kind of like uh, it's been on and off. Now I've been the most consistent, like the past year and a half, two years, I've been really consistent with it. Now that I'm, I'm older, right? Like I'm 22. I feel like there's no more time to waste. Like this is the time now to to be training as much as I possibly can. But like uh, when I was like. I think it was in 2017 like I, I was telling myself I wanted to do MMA like I was saying professionally and I competed at Worlds at Blue Belt but it was like right after I competed at Worlds I got this knee injury and I kind of like I got in a relationship you know how it is man like got distracted for like a year. Oh, they ruin yeah, everything every, they ruin every time man it's, it's always the relationships bro I swear every time <laughs> he's someone gone they're like oh man you got a girlfriend but <laughs> yeah once that ended like uh i had my first mma fight like right after that and then i was like okay let's focus now so that's, definitely the past two years i'd say it's usually what i what i found in the history of like training with people it's usually two things happen you get a girlfriend or a boyfriend you know you know we're uh, yeah. it's 2020 we gotta you know we're accepting both sides of the things you know yeah. somebody gets into a relationship with somebody or they get a blue belt and they just disappear like the rest yeah. of the <laughs> forever <laughs> Yeah, every time. It's sad, bro. Like, I, I honestly, nowadays, I don't even like wearing white belts' names. I just always expect <laughs> them to, to quit. Like, I'm not trying to discriminate against the white belts here, man, but you know how it is. I've seen so many white belts come and go. It's crazy. Yeah, it's true, man. Like, you think about all the people you've probably trained with before and they've gone, right? Um, are you mostly training uh, in the gi or are you doing no gi? Oh, I love both, man. I, we uh, During the COVID times, you kind of had to – uh, like switch up the training right 
before it was just mostly all gi at the Kamsi Jiu Jitsu, but since COVID, we've actually like really pushed ourselves towards no gi, like with the with leg locks becoming legal in IBJJF 2021. We need to know like no gi. We have to know heel hooks. Obviously, heel hooks aren't going to be legal in the gi. So we split it up like 50 50. Like we'll go one day gi, one day no gi. Because it's kind of like, it's not like scheduled training anymore. It's always like we're yeah. trying to get a group of guys, right? That we trust, right? And then go one each. Yeah. Would your preference be to be on, on either or, or just you're going to start to lean towards one way? Uh, I'm definitely leaning towards Nogi. I think there's more money to be made in Nogi mm -hmm. because like, I, I feel like the casual audience is more attracted to things that relate to combat sports and MMA. And when you see someone with a gi on, you know, like look at judo, like judo is a very popular international sport, but there's not too many people, at least from my knowledge, making money off of judo. But now we see with Nogi with guys like Gordon Ryan and, people opening these schools everywhere, like with the instructionals happening. I think the Nogi uh, era is like just beginning. Like in the next five to 10 years, I think you'll see like people making some real money. Like Gordon Ryan has proved it. You can make some real money in jujitsu. It, it's no longer like a joke. Like, And not just by opening a school too, because you can make a lot of money opening a school, but now you can like also be an athlete, right? And fund your, your whole career, if that makes sense. And you don't even have, like, I don't think in like five years, you're going to have to be like the top echelon to even make, you know, like a dime. Right. I think it's going to be. more. Yeah. Bad. I think that's what's happening, especially like the last couple of years with him. Cause usually like, let's say 10 years ago, like when I was training, when I was training more and I was like a blue belt, basically like the goal was go to worlds, win a couple titles, open up a school. It was especially with the gi. I'm talking about the gi. And then yeah. like, you know, there's more and more tournaments that are coming up, even in the gi, like Abu Dhabi pro and things like that, that are actually paying people. And the IBG, some of the IBGF tournaments, uh, they're, they're starting to pay for like pro yeah. like gi divisions and things like that, which I think there needs to be more and more of that, of course, yeah. over time. But then like, I think Gordon's come along and he's kind of changed the model of it where, you know, he's putting out a lot more instructionals. There's a lot more social media, there's a lot more sponsors, things like yeah. that. To so much exposure nowadays. Yeah. What's um like for your, for yourself personally, like what is your kind of strategy um, or like, I guess kind of business model or strategy in order for you to like make it, making money in the sport. Is it going to be like seminars, DVDs? Like what's the, what's the game plan for you? From what I've seen, like, uh, from what most of the top athletes have been doing. Like I see that they win something very notable. So let's say like Lachlan Giles, he got like second to ADCC. You see all of a sudden he goes on like a seminar tour. And I think there's a lot of money being made right after you like win something really big. So let's say I won like a, like a black belt uh, world championship. I think that's the time to strike and like really focus on the seminar. I, I should, I should be realistic with myself at, if I'm a purple belt right now, even winning a gold at purple belt, there's not going to be a lot of opportunities for, to make a lot of money. You could throw a lot of seminars, but then that's kind of going to take away from your training a bit. So you just have to be careful with it. You don't want to be too focused on like, like in the money making aspect too early in your career. And that's just my opinion though, because to keep up with these guys, like the up and comers and the purple belts, like these guys are crazy, man. I, I've met, like I've trained with a lot of these good purple belts who are like, hands medalists, what have you, like, man, they're going to be smashing all these brown belts and black belts in two to three years. And there's like no time to waste by like thinking I'm going to make an instructional at purple belt, right? Like no one's going to care. I have to win something big first and then, and then you can focus on seminars and where you were listing. Right. Yeah. I think you said it, right. It's like, now is the time to like really focus on training, getting better, putting yeah. yourself in position to, to be able to do that. Right. Rather than kind of like focusing on the small things right now and just yeah. like focus on training. That's one big thing, like big long-term goal, but focusing training on training and winning, training one. and winning. Like yeah. you have to rack up the wins and just prove who you are because I, like even winning once or once or twice, like that, that don't mean anything. You have to consistently be good guys mm -hmm. and make a name for yourself or if someone sees your name on like a card, like, because, yeah, now we're seeing, like, pro cards and stuff, which is sick, like, third coast grappling, fight to win, all that stuff. People are paying their athletes. But so let's say you start, like, racking up the wings, and now they see, like, 
oh, your name's on that bracket. Like that guy's going to bring a small book. It's going to be a good event. Like, and once you have that too, then you can start making money. You just don't want to be unrealistic, right? You don't want to lie to yourself about like, oh, I'm going to be a cool bunch of money right now. It's like, nah, man, it's jujitsu. I'm going to make a whole bunch of money. I just signed up uh, to my class a month ago. <laughs> yeah, man. It's one grappling industries, bro. It's like time to reel it in. Let's go. Wait, I won my white belt beginner division. I had, I had seven matches, bro. Come at me. Where's my but, contract? Where's my contract? No, but, you know, at least you're realistic with it. Yeah. Um, I think a yeah. lot of people, they'll – They'll compete a lot. Like I know like me and Aaron did at like blue belt and purple belt. You compete a lot at like the lower belts. And then when you get to like the higher belts, like brown and black, you still want to yeah. compete more. But then at the same time, that's when I think a lot of, you'll see a lot more brown and black belts, not really competing as much because maybe they're focused on teaching. That's kind of yeah. like why I step back from competing quite a bit. Also like I had a ton of injuries as well, but that's something I want to get back into is, you know, down the road too but i think you said it it's like the lower belts like especially right now it's this is the time where you're like you're building your skills and you want to you know you want to get noticed and then you want to you know win win some big things and be like okay like now i can make this dvd or i can make this or i can make that and i can kind of show you like what i can do you got to be tunnel vision like you guys know the daisy fresh guys up in uh, illinois yeah so like like if you look at them they're a perfect example so the Jorge, he, he just won, uh, I forget what division it was, but it was purple belt. I think it was heavy. He won gold. Jacob Couch, uh, he won double gold. Alejandro, uh, he's in my division. He got, he got third. And you, you see, like, some of the conditions they're living in, they're, like, living in the gym. Like, that's their life. They're not living some lavish life thinking about making money. The only thing on their mind is, is winning, getting the golds. And now you see, like, uh, Jacob's finally getting the recognition he deserves, right? Uh, recently submitting that. Uh, ADCC veteran I can't remember that his name but I don't know if you guys saw that but then right after he gets double gold right now you see full grappling making articles about him see now he can start like building momentum he's like a couple wins away from like really breaking into like uh mainstream jiu-jitsu I would say yeah and, but it's like, it's like the sacrifice like man like the what they live in and train in it's admirable it's like you really respect that kind of uh the passion for jiu-jitsu I think there's a lot of untapped talent or a lot of people that just, they've been training a long time. They're really good, but they just haven't really been noticed by like the flow grapplings and oh, like people in the U S oh, yeah. and like, I think a perfect example of that yeah. recently was like Steve Sims who, yeah. you know, he got bronze in the absolute and like he had a yeah. really close, he had a really close match with Hulk in the absolute. Who's like, you know, top of the top. And then he also, I think he lost to Ronaldo jr. By I think an advantage. Oh, that match was so and close, man. He, he yeah. actually, uh, that's funny. Uh, Steve Sims really good. We, we just competed against each other. Uh, I forget what it was. I think it was like September or, or August at like a uh, Toronto top team had that in-house right for the cash prize. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, man, this guy's good. Like, I honestly, I expected to win, and he he submitted me with an arm triangle about like three minutes in the match. His wrestling was so good. The top pressure, like the way he he like C grips the armpit and everything, and just rests in reverse De La Riva, not wasting any energy. Like super good. He actually cornered me at uh, at Pan Ams, but it's it's what you're saying. People don't know. Like I think like the top level, there's so many guys who are like close to each other, right? Close to each yeah. other on that skill level. Like you've seen it, like with that Ronaldo match, it was so close the whole time. Like I was, I was right there, like trying to like yell instructions for him and stuff. But but obviously he's a black belt. What can I do? That's a purple belt, right? You know what I mean? But like he's right there for sure. Like I saw it with my own eyes. I feel like in that Ronaldo fight, like Ronaldo did not want to wrestle with him. Uh, once he had that advantage, he he did a really good job strategically of like of holding on to that advantage and not giving giving anything up. But it's exactly what you're saying. There's so much like untapped potential because there's so many good guys in Canada and America who have no exposure, like no exposure whatsoever. Yeah, it's just like, that's, oh, no. that's that's kind of a reason why like we want to have like guys like you on where it's like you're you you're guys at top level and yeah. it's just nobody knows because like I don't know you you don't live in the GTA you live in you know like Windsor you know Windsor Ontario and you're just you're training with guys there but like you know potentially yeah. like world-class talent right so yeah seriously no one knows no and one like, knows. I, like to, to mention that like training wins around Terry like that you know that bjj damien guy like he has so much exposure has like three thousand five hundred followers like he's a hands out gracie guy 
like uh, we were going back and forth a bit on Instagram. You know, yeah. Right. yeah I, I, I wanted to ask you about this. So what what was this all about? How this Man. beef all start? Dude, this guy is crazy. I, I re- like okay. So when I first messaged him, I was like respecting his skill because it was like, oh, Henzo guy, lots of followers, purple belt near my weight. Like this is perfect. Like I, I maybe I can set up like a super fight bet match. And I think he just like I don't know if he's trying to like be like Gordon. Is like some of the stuff he's doing is like super cringe because it was just like copying and pasting Gordon's exact behavior. Well, you can't do that, right? Like we've seen, we already seen this in the UFC with like Conor McGregor making all this money by making a persona. And instead of fighters actually making their own persona, they just started wearing sunglasses and dressing nice and talking shit and acting like McGregor. And then they wouldn't get popular. So it's because like, we already seen that character. McGregor's the character. So Damien was trying to like play off the Gordon character. I was just asking for a bet match and then he's going off and, in the DMs, and it kind of like rubbed me the wrong way. So I was like, "Fuck you!" Buddy. What do you? I gotta ask you about that because there's a lot of like. I guess yeah. Gordon's kind of set the trend of like, you know, he's he's confident in his skills to say the least. So like, yeah. he'll be like, you know what, like, he, hey, I mean, he, he can say it. <laughs> yeah, he's he's the top guy in the world right now, nogi wise. Like, nobody, yeah, exactly. nobody's touched him since like in a couple of years. But like, what are your thoughts on? I guess like the MMA, I guess, you know, attitude or like, I'm going to call this guy out or that guy out, but like more for, you know, like, I guess if you want to call BJJ a traditional martial art, but more for that, like, is that, is that the root that like, are you cool with it? Or are you just like, ah, whatever, this guy's talking shit. Okay, let's go. Let's yeah. fight. Like what, what, I don't know what your thoughts are on that whole, whole thing. It's like, well, so there's going to be some characters and, in- and people in general who are good at talking shit and who are entertaining in the way they do it. But then there's going to be some people like when they talk shit and it's just cringe and you like, you kind of want to turn the, uh, the video off. Right. Especially in jujitsu. You have to think we're not fighting here, man. Like, so it doesn't even, it doesn't even matter how you approach it. Like we ain't throwing punches. It's like, you I'm mean, dying in fights. You mean, it's sorry, really I don't, I don't, I don't want to cut you off, but yeah. pulling on, pulling on a lapel, that's not a fight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man. It's like, <laughs> It, it really is, man. It's like if there's dudes trying to like throw head kicks at you and damage you, like knock your teeth out, like give you permanent brain damage. Like that's a fight. And I get you talking shit and you're saying like, oh, like going Mike Tyson, I'm saying you're going to like take their soul and all, all that kind of shit. But it, when it's with jujitsu, you have to kind of like pull yourself back. And I get the marketing ploy side of it. Like I get it. You're, you're marketing yourself. You're trying to make money. That makes sense. I respect that. But then you're also like kind of line crossing too at a certain point, right? There's like a certain point where you're just marketing and then a certain point where you're just like, okay, this guy's just being a, yeah, like there's a straight like a, out. There's I mean, like a certain level of respect to it, I think. Like, yeah. if they're like, hey man. The day for grappling, man. Like, oh, you beat me by an advantage. <laughs> Whoopity you know, do. You know, right? like, <laughs> <"Whoopity dude." laughs> you beat me. We're going to fight to the death. I'm going to grab your lapel and stall you out and win by an advantage. This is, yeah. this is war. This yeah. is war. I tell you. It's like, relax guys, calm down. Like I get like, dude, some uh, jujitsu matches can be scraps, like some straight scraps, like Nikki rod, like bloodies people up. Right. So, but it's still not a fight. It's still way different than a fight, man. So it's like, maybe if, maybe maybe if nikki rod is is competing then it's a fight because yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. it feels like you're you're rolling with a freight train yeah, that dude's so athletic i seen him uh i remember i competed at like a high roller i think about a year and a, like a year ago i'm gonna say and, and it was in pittsburgh it was so funny because he was in the absolute division in the first fight like i had no idea who nikki rod was at this point he hadn't competed in adcc and I see him, I'm like, man, who's this guy walking around? Like, he's fucking huge. Like, this guy's intimidating. Am I going to have to fight this guy? And so, like, like seriously, I was like, shit. Like, I wasn't expecting this. His first matchup, man, they put him against the tiniest, frailest little blue belt. Straight up. Like, <laughs> Bro, I was like, why the fuck did they – like, they just sent this man to die. Like, seriously. <laughs> like, like it, it, it was so funny, too, because Nicky Rod was just playing with him, like, instantly just, like, tossed him on his back and was, like, just, like, trying out, like, Kimura traps and shit because he could do whatever he wanted. Like, he was actually kind of nice about it because like, you could tell he, he could have ripped the dude's arm off and – he was kind of respectful. I was like, shit, bro. Was like, what so a guy's a truck. Like, he, he's an absolute truck. And a guy won, no, whoa, he beat Cyborg for fuck's sake. Yeah. In ADCC. 
and you're putting him up against a blue belt. Like, that's just not fair. <laughs> like, oh, but imagine, imagine that's your bracket, bro. Like, that's a person. <laughs> Aaron <laughs> Gall, <laughs> Michael Briars, Nikki Rod. Nikki I'd, be, Rod. I'd be tagging Aaron and be like, well, you got this, bro. I'll see you later. Yeah. <laughs> like, what are so, you supposed to do, man? Like, just show up to high rollers, ready for a good time, and then you got to fight him. Like, dang. Dang. Now, yeah. if you want to get some more high rollers, you want to go to Spirit Leaf Waterdown, located at Aaron. 64 Ontario Street in Waterdown. Right Hamilton, Street Street. From- Hamilton Street. Hamilton <laughs> Street. 64 Hamilton Street. Get, let's get our shit in. Now, See, it Max, happens. Now, Max, like, what are – so, since we're talking about high rollers, what is that tournament and, like, what is the format of it? It's actually pretty nice, man. It's a really chill environment, like, compared to – uh, like IBJJF tournaments, I feel like I get the most nervous for it. Like I wasn't too nervous for the fight to wins or any kind of super fights I've done or, you know, grappling industries. IBJJF, I don't know what it is about it, but you get really nervous. High rollers, man, it's it's relaxed. Like they're playing music and stuff. So it kind of just feels like like open mat, right? You don't just hear like people screaming and shit. Like they have like chill music, you know, guys are smoking weed. It's, it's, it's a good format. I like the rule set a lot too. I think it's a really good rule set especially for guys who want to like, like truly test their ability. Cause I'm pretty sure it's all like a Nogi. It's all absolute, right? There's no weight divisions. I could be wrong about that. I think it's just in the gears weight divisions, but I like that. It's like all absolute. Cause that's really testing yourself. Cause sometimes uh, there's so many divisions that you end up fighting like guys who aren't really on your level and you don't get tested. Right. So I think it's like, it's a great tournament. I'll say I got nothing about good things to say about them. And is that they, because what, what state do they host that one in? Is that all in California or? Oh, that one was in Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Yeah, that one was in Pennsylvania. It was funny because the building that it was in was like, I don't know what was happening. So the building, there's this like hallway that attached like two buildings, right? And so when you go through this hallway and then you open the door, so that's the high rollers venue. And there's people smoking weed, right? There's like rap music on, people scrapping. And then on the other side, Man, it was a little, uh, like a little league of soccer. Like all these little kids, like poking through the window, like after mom and dad, like, what's that smell? It, it was just like so <laughs> surreal. I was like, what's happening right now? It's like, do they really book this at the same time as a little league tournament? It was crazy. That's funny. <laughs> what a great time to host a little league soccer game. Mommy, what's yeah. that smell? <laughs> yeah. I was like, man, these poor kids, bro. They got no idea. I guess I guess the reason why it's so chill is because of the substances that people are usually doing before they step onto the mats. That could be argued. That could be argued. So what's your like mentality like going before a competition? So especially like does it change? Obviously, if you're like IBJF, you're a little bit more nervous, or is it the same kind of routine? Like what's kind of like your process? Mm. Um, so my mentality is something I like I continuously try to change because yeah, I feel the mental game is so important going into a tournament, especially with what you're saying. If you're like switching up the formats and the rule sets, you, you always have to have different priorities and, and set. Like if it's a sub only, I would say I would try to be like coming in like as calm as I can, right? Like have a, have a decent game plan of my favorite submissions, right? We're not like trying to go in there and kill for IBJJF though. Like it's only seven minutes, seven minutes and points. I I, usually I come into those tournaments, like I'm a lot more aggressive, like focus, like, okay, here's my pass here. I'm going to get the points with this, 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 but yeah, I feel like my mindset's like changing with every tournament because I realize things I do wrong and I I immediately want to adjust. Like, like I need, especially like with, uh, so worlds in 2019, like I placed third at worlds. And I think that's like, that really changed my mindset. Cause when I went into that tournament, like I didn't, you never think if you've never like won a big medal, you never think you're going to win like or place even at worlds. Cause it's like, even to win a match, you're like, Oh, I, I want to match. Like I'm in the qualifier. I'm in the quarterfinal. But then when you finally, uh, so when I like want a match, want a match, want a match, want a match. And then I was in the semi, like I almost mentally checked out. Cause it was like, Oh, I got, I got third place in the world. Like, it doesn't even matter if I win or lose now. Cause I, so that, that was like a mental weakness. Cause I didn't even, uh, I didn't even believe that I could get first place, let gotcha. alone like third place. Right. So I, I totally mentally checked out. And in that semifinal, it was just such a, it's such a poor performance. Cause even while I was fighting 
I was kind of like subconsciously telling myself that the outcome of that match didn't matter because I was already satisfied. Right. So like, gotcha. That, like, I really was like really focused on my mindset and trying to be like, like number one now, not just going into like improve or test myself. It's like, no, 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 we're going into win. We're going into win 100%. Like no silvers, no thirds, like gold only. That should be the goal. Like even with losing this tournament at Pans, I get people like congratulations on the silver medal. Honestly, a silver medal is fucking, it's, it's shit. It's like, dang, it's almost worse than the third because I was that close. And just, mm. I think, uh, I think you mentioned something important though. I think maybe like there was like a mental barrier at like 2019. You're like, Oh, you're like, I don't know. You're like, eh, I'm good. I think I can hang. And then you got a bronze medal and you're like, ah, fuck it. I'm good. I got, I got a bronze. I'm good. But now I think now that you got that bronze, you're like, okay, I got it. I'm at that level. Like I need to, I can go beyond that. Like, yeah, you know, you're right there. Cause honestly, all those guys who are on the podium, like they're all the same level. Like, they're not so they're not so different. Obviously, there's some anomalies. There's some guys who are like way above everyone else. Like I think a good example like was like Roberto Jimenez when he yep. was in purple belt and brown belt would just smash everyone, right? So you do have anomalies, right? Yeah. But like- for the most part, if you're placing at worlds, if you're placing at pants, yeah, it's like it doesn't matter if you're getting third or first. Like you can get that first every time, right? You just have to play your cards right when you're fighting. Like, especially in that, that the final two of the pants, I feel like me and uh, what's his name? Uh, Sean Yadamarco, like he, he approached it very intelligently. Like this whole game, like the strategy of like shutting down my single X. Like once I got single X on him, he made sure like never to, to step up off his knees, just the way he was playing. Like, okay, now I'm going to go body lock passing because this guy clearly likes to elevate me. Like if I had just even played like a little bit differently in strategy, like instead of let's say going for single X, dropping down, I wrestled instead like that could have changed the outcome of the match so now i'm learning like how even it is and skill and and like learning like the importance of like having experience in tournaments right because it's like a little, little like 20 second uh segments in a match where that can decide the rest of the like the momentum like you ever have like your guard pass in a tournament by someone who's like real strong and you're like there's like a minute left and you know like i'm not getting those three points right and it's like, that's how you have to play, like, so strategically, like, mm-hmm. knowing, I like, okay, if I get the points with this much time left, or I get the advantage with this much time left, and then go to this position, he won't be able to get, like, even if he's, let's say he's be- even a little bit better than me, if I can play the right strategy and stay calm and play by the rules, right, I could, I can end up winning, even if a guy is better. Yes, I think that's that definitely separates the people that are getting like bronze to the people that are getting gold. I think the biggest thing is the strategy and how they're playing and how they're playing in different situations based on, you know, what the person's doing. I think you just laid out like a perfect example of, you know, what can happen and like what adjustments people like maybe even you or somebody else have to make mid-match to yeah, change things. Yeah, it happens so fast. That's the thing with this COVID. I wish I could compete more often. Like a 2019, I competed like 15 times. This year, I only competed, I think, five tournaments. So it's like now, now you can only get so much experience. So when those like, like you're talking about those little situations happen mid match, you're like, you're slow on the on the uptake, right? You're slow mm-hmm. to react because you're you're not used to that, the tournament pace because it's different. Mm-hmm. It's, it's going to be different than training, 100. percent so I was going to ask you like during COVID this year, like how has your training been? Like what's uh, so the, the, the gyms that you're training at, what are they doing? Like, are there COVID protocols like in Windsor? Like, is it just like training yeehaw freedom guns America? Like what's the, like what, what, what's changed from like what's happened the beginning of this year to now training wise for you? Uh, a lot. It's totally different actually. Cause uh, originally, so from, early 2019 to, to no, no. So I'd say, I'd say mid 2019 to early 2020, I was driving to Ohio every day to train with Dante, right? Cause that's Dante Leon. He's one of the best. I, I have to get experience with one of the best in the sport. Right. So I was training with him and then come uh, driving back to Ohio, then training at my home gym, like then lifting at night and then working part time on top of that. So it was just like, it was a lot. Right. But it kept mm-hmm. me like busy. With COVID, like there's so much free time, it's it's easy to kind of lose focus. 
and, and slack on your training. Cause you could tell yourself, Oh, okay. My gym's not open. I can't train. But like, I think that's, I think it's just like a mental weakness. Like you definitely can train. Like I've, I've been, I've been kind of like harassing the blue belts at my school. Like I'll show up. There's this one dude named Gabby. I literally show up to his house at like 11 at night. Cause he has mats in his garage and like, we're, dr- we're drilling, man. Like, let's go. We're drilling. Like, seriously, like, I'm like, like almost abusing this guy just cause uh, I'm, I'm trying to find as many training partners as I can. Like sometimes during the beginning of COVID, I would drive to Toronto and back in the same day, just cause I know like, Oh, two really good guys are training and they have like an extra spot. Cause I don't know what kind of training you guys are doing during COVID, but it's very, uh, the amount of people was very limited. Yeah. So that's basically it's what sporadic. it's sorry, been. What sorry. Uh, I didn't, I didn't mean to cut out there, but yeah, it's been very sporadic. Like I've been doing, like I think pretty much the best way to really handle it is like you have a, a small group of people that you know and trust and you, you stick yeah. with them. And then that's your crew that you train with. And that's kind of like, yeah. like what I, I was doing. Like, cause I was actually, cause I have an interesting, well, we'll get your kind of your story on like, you know, flying home and everything from like July with like July's tournament. And like recently just with like restrictions and everything, but yeah, pretty much like kind of like may then i had like one or two like dedicated people like my wife trains as well so it was like drilling some stuff with her yes. and then which big help and then like i have like one or two other people that was like okay like you're going to work you go home i go to work you go home all right let's train together like just kind of like yeah. knowing like people's situations and then just kind of managing training that way exactly you could only have so many people right like in the, in the beginning of COVID, we were training in a garage, like my coach's garage, which was tough training. It was, it was like me, TJ Laramie, my coach Dozer, uh, Eric Maritet, uh, and uh, Philip Mikovich, sometimes uh, my friend Gabriel, Gabriel uh, Blue Belt. But it was just basically those were the like the five, six guys. And we just <laughs> stay. But it's like it's all really good guys. There's no more like really shitty blue belts and white belts you can kind of test shit on it was only, <laughs> you, know, you know like there's no there's no, no more restaurants bro it was like it was just straight hard training every single day which was it was actually kind of a blessing in itself because uh some days you'd wake up and be like dang i have to go roll those guys again man like you're sore and you're training in a cramped garage and you, you like you're like oh i can just relax today i just got the serve and it came in you know what like bro that's what me and aaron that's what me and aaron were doing that time we're like we got our biggest sponsor uh on this podcast man yeah there's so many influences to to stop you from training right but i think it's been good for for mental strength COVID, like uh, really building discipline and really like forcing yourself to train no matter what like it it doesn't matter if we're on lockdown it's like we can train three people it doesn't matter if it's like red zone what what have you like we're gonna find a way to train whether it's in a garage we got to drive to London. Who gives a fuck? We're driving to London. We're driving to Chatham. We're driving to Toronto. We're finding a way to train because man, th- these guys in America, they're training like, like normally a lot of the, the States, like the days yeah. first guy, they're training with world champions, training with each other multiple times a day. It's like, do I think I'm going to keep up with those guys? If I'm not training multiple times a day. So it don't, so it doesn't matter. Right. With this whole COVID thing, I have to find a way to train multiple times a day and get quality training in. Yeah, I think you said it because it's like the biggest thing is, is they they didn't stop. They stopped for a little bit and they just kept going with the thing and they got those multiple training partners, world class individuals, and then yeah. we all got shut down. It's like you again, the the athletes that wanna get that gold medal, they find a way to get it done. And that's what you're yeah. doing, right? Let alone the circumstances. Yeah, it's gotta be that way, man. It's gotta be that way. It's sad to see. A lot of people I thought wouldn't fall off fell off because I mean I don't blame them. They they have their reasons, right? I can't judge them, but it's just like it's like dang man, it's 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 hard to see. It's just like the all these gyms shutting down and the small businesses shutting down and seeing people like almost quit jujitsu entirely. They're just like playing Warzone every day. It's like, <laughs> dude, like dude, Warzone, dude, Warzone is taking. It's taking people away, man. It's taking people away. It's like it's claimed like, more, but it's claimed more blue belts' COVID. lives than COVID itself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 we've lost another one to video games, unfortunately. Yeah, seriously. Now Cold War is coming out. It's like even more going to be taken from us. It's, it's rough oh, time. Is, is is that the one Greg King was playing and he was streaming forever? <laughs> I don't know like, what the fuck he's playing. He's probably stuck oh, on the four hundred one or something. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. 
Like, fuck, a guy's just fucking stream. Oh, I can't do jujitsu now, so I guess I'll just stream my fucking shit now. Nobody wants to watch your fucking game, okay? Fuck <laughs> hey, bro. Hey, bro. I'm going to shoot. What the hell, bro? I'm stuck on the 401. What's going on? Bro. Ooh, spy Mikey. <laughs> <laughs> Max, uh, and so another thing I want to ask you, like COVID related. Um, yeah. So I have my own travel story because I was traveling in March when it was like basically the uh, whole week. world, the whole world was going yeah. to shit. Literally, I went away one week. I went to Costa Rica. I'm like, I'm gonna go on vacation and take a nice family vacation with the family. Mm-hmm. I trained down there, like most beautiful country I think I've ever been to. Date, it's amazing. And then like, it's just I can see the the deterioration of society, like. The Monday I was there, the oh, Tuesday geez. I was, so it was like that week was like Trudeau's like wife got like COVID and then like the NBA oh, yeah. season got shut down and like, it was like all this crazy stuff. And I'm looking at my wife, like, what the fuck is going on? Like, yeah. cause like we're, meanwhile, we're on vacation and it's like literally like the, we got there Saturday and then like the Monday, it's just the whole world just started falling apart. Oh dude, shit hit the fan so fast. It was crazy. It was like everyone just immediately started to live the exact same life like it was just like everyone was doing the same thing like they're all scared of covid all stuck in their homes all watching tiger king like wh- what have you bro. Like, oh. except i always yeah. stuck watching tiger king i was stuck in like a tropical country i probably should have stayed there but yeah besides the point but like when i when i was traveling home because i don't know what the hell was happening in canada like i went away for a week and i'm like okay like am i gonna come back i'm gonna have to buy a shotgun to like protect yeah. myself like i don't know what's yeah. like i don't know what's happening i actually had to call aaron like in the middle of my vacation because like I'm, I'm supposed to be returning to work i'm like aaron what the fuck is going on yeah. <laughs> this is basically the extent of the conversation i'm like i'm reading all this stuff like what is going on like am i get like number one am i am i even going to be able to get home yeah. this is just like all the thoughts of my mind like am i even going to be able to get home they're putting out like travel advisories i'm like can I even fly yeah, back Yeah, I was home? sketchy for a bit, eh? Like, uh, was... my friend was in Florida. I was like, fuck, is he going to get stuck there, bro? It's like, I'm going to close the borders. Like, it was just mass panic. It's like what you said. Like, what the fuck is going on? That was, like, the motto of 2020, dude. Yeah, Actually. like, because I, I was there. And then when I, I was flying back, so we're, like, waiting in Houston. We're getting a – we're, like, at our layover. And then we finally get on the plane. We land in Toronto. It's literally, like – So I landed and it's just like, it felt like another day in Toronto. Like it was the strangest thing. It's like, I'm reading about a week of like, the world is falling apart. And then I get back and then they're like, there's, you know, I, you know, I'm thinking there's going to be zombies at Pearson or something. I I don't know what's happening. And then I'm going through like the, you know, it's like the usual prompts that you go through when you're, you know, when you're traveling, it's like, Hey, you know, passport security, all that. And then yeah. the only thing related to COVID that I got, and this is my, I'm talking about my own personal experience here is so when I was like, you know, swiping back in, like given like my passport and everything, there's like, you know, like there's a little like kiosk that you go to, you put in all yeah. your info. So I did that and they're like, okay, so click yes to agree. You have to self isolate for 14 days due to COVID click. Yes. That's it. Yeah, so that I, I walk, I walked out of the airport. I'm, I'm looking at my wife. I'm like, okay, like I can hop in an Uber, go to Toronto. I can, you know, pee on every third building, cough on everybody. <laughs> if I really want, like I can, like yeah. there's nothing really stopping me from basically like doing what I want. So eventually, you know, we got a, we got our car, like drove home and we're like, it was the weirdest yeah. thing ever. And then the next day we drove around and it, and it was like a Monday or Tuesday. So it was a work day. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? So it was like, you know, mid afternoon, I'm driving around. We were the only car on the road. <laughs> yeah, dude. I remember Toronto was like that in the beginning, man. It was so surreal to see like just no cars. There was no, it was nothing. So I live in like, I live between like Vaughn and like Toronto. So there's like a big buffer. There's a lot of like houses yeah. and po- population there. So like I'm driving around Toronto, like I'm on the Gardner at like five on a tuesday and i'm like normally it's packed like bumper to bumper car like yeah. i'm the only one like driving around like going moving around like where the hell is everybody like what's going on mm-hmm. it literally felt like the simpsons were like homer's in a coma he wakes up he's like the last person like on earth yeah but then so like that's kind of my experience now like let's kind of fast forward to now for you like what have you been so like you traveled in july you traveled just recently like 
what's the experience like? What, like, what's the process? Like, are you going to get herpes if you go to Texas? Like what's, what's going on? <laughs> no, honestly, I don't like, I don't, it was weird that everyone says like the cases are so high in Texas. Like I went to Texas and I've been to Georgia and I went to Las Vegas too. I didn't get COVID. I trained with hundreds of people. I was that extreme Couture, uh, 10th planet of Austin, uh, the Pan Ams, right? I didn't get COVID. So I don't know how, like, it's kind of weird to see, but, but I'll say like, it, it was the same thing with the kiosk when I was coming back from Austin. Uh, you, basically there was nothing stopping you from doing anything. Like absolutely nothing. You could basically, you're just giving your word that you weren't going to uh, leave self-isolation. But now when I came this time, it was weird. So on November 21st, when I was still, that was the day I was competing. So it's still in America. Basically that you ha- you're required Apparently, they just put in a law. You have to, like, download some app. Like, uh, it was, like, can alert or something. Something like that. Oh, probably the COVID like, alert app. Yeah, no, it wasn't that. It was actually – it was some travel app. It wasn't that. It oh, was okay. I didn't even hear about it. See, no one heard about it, and they, like, gave me such a hard time. It's so dumb. But, yeah, so I came back, and they are like, yeah, you're supposed to download this app. It's a law now. And I was like – I was in America. Like, you guys just – like, how, how can you pass a law just randomly like that? It's like, isn't parliament adjourned or something right now? I don't know. So it was really weird. But they gave me this, like, this paper. They're like, okay, you're you're on a list now. Like, you're, you're listed as non-compliant. So I'm like, oh, shit. Like, this, <laughs> this is kind of different now. And so I, I have to call them every single day and tell them I don't have COVID, give them all my information every single day. If I don't call, I don't know what's going to happen. So I'm kind of, like, paranoid as fuck. They sent me, like, emails, a bunch of emails that I could be fine all this money. I could be put in jail. So it's like, man, like, it's, it's, it's making me paranoid, bro. Like, I actually don't want to leave at all whatsoever. I don't want to break this uh, self-isolation just because, I don't know, man. They're really serious about it this time. Like, compared to your experience, right, that was very similar to my first one. But now they're, like, kind of cracking down on it. Mm-hmm. Which, so you know, like, how, many more day, how many more days you got left in isolation? Uh, I got, I think I got eight days left. Eight days. Okay. Yeah. So, so what's the, the game plan as soon as you're able to get out of isolation? So once I'm out of isolation, I mean, it's back, it's back to business. We're training multiple times a day. We're rolling. It's what it is. The training continues. You're going to continue to get better. For sure though, my, my game plan is to get better at wrestling. I think that was, uh, I don't think my wrestling is too bad, but it's since we've been training in garages and, you know, not, not like full gyms, now we've got a full gym to train in, so it's not really that big of a deal. But I wasn't wrestling too much, so I wasn't confident in my wrestling. And I think that would have helped me a lot in the finals match. Like, uh, I was in, like, reverse De La Hiva, and I arm dragged over. And then, like, I stood up. I had the single leg. And instead of going to single leg, I dropped down to single legs and then went to uh, an ankle lock, which is – I finished my first match of the day in, like, 30 seconds with that. That's, like, my go-to move right after finish countless matches like that but but still I should it's a strategy thing right like I, I should have been more focused on getting some points since he was putting the pressure low match so the game plan is to get better at wrestling the next three months is super wrestling uh focus for sure for sure what's the next tournament on your your radar I don't know man I don't know because uh there's nothing really announced for 2021. I'm not going to be able to leave so soon uh, to America because there isn't anything really worth it. I, I might do a third coast event if they, if they'll have me right now that it's kind of hard to, to get spots on like good cards, but hopefully now that I like I got third at worlds now, now, now second at pants, maybe they'll be like, okay, this guy's legit. So I'm hoping maybe if I can get on a third coast event, that'd be great. If I could get on uh, like any of those like super fight promotions, that would be awesome. But there's no tournaments coming up. Like I wanted to do the ADCC trials. That was mm-hmm. my plan, but they, they kept on, uh, I have no idea when they're going to have it. I so think we'll they, see they if they'll pushed, announce it. They pushed it back, unfortunately, but, but it's, yeah. I understand because I think they're having issues with trying to get qualified refs in, yeah. into the, into the U S for 2021. But there's so many travel restrictions from Europe going to the U S that like it, it realistically, like, they kind of had to push back the event, unfortunately, but hopefully yeah. and it's, you can't run an ADCC and then not have a trials either. So, yeah. 
without giving, you know, some people uh, an opportunity to get some exposure and to maybe even get an invite or to win a, win, win your own ticket there. That's the biggest thing about trials is exposure for sure. Mm-hmm. Definitely make a name for yourself right away, but hopefully in 2021, like uh, when January rolls around, they'll announce a new day for the trials at least. Hopefully they'll yeah. uh, be bigger pictures of what's going to happen competition wise, but there isn't a lot going on now that pants is over uh master world is gonna happen like i can't really think of anything too worth like taking another like two weeks off work because of self-isolation paying all the money to fly right it's 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 more worth my time just to train and, and continue to add to my skills yeah i agree it's it's hard to do tournaments right now especially with when you get back you're basically you turn a one-week vacation to a three-week vacation when yeah. you have to basically sit at home <laughs> the other two weeks and basically do nothing yeah that's what they that's what a lot of the competitors in america don't understand right now i mean canada's kind of being uh the canadian athletes are being held back but we're, we're gonna have our time man there's a lot of good canadians that people don't know about man i've trained with some like in like places in chatham like concept academy there's like this dude named jedediah wells like he doesn't have a lot of tournament experience but man that guy is as good as anyone it, it's crazy how you, you you'll go into these gyms and you roll these dudes and you're just like, that guy's got no accolades. Like, fuck it's, it's, it's only because they just don't compete. They're just as good, but they just don't compete. So people don't know how good they are. It's what we were saying earlier. Mm-hmm. But I, I, th- I feel like um, slowly as like vaccines are coming out and, you know, uh, travel restrictions are lifted and more competitions happen. People are going to see what Canada is made of because Steve Sims good, did a really good job of kind of putting us out there. Like, I hope to fucking at least show that we got, like, gold medal talent in Canada. Uh, Lucas Beavis, he's out out of uh, Alberta. He's real good. Like, there's some Canadians that people don't know about. They're going to learn. They're going to learn real quick. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a matter of time, especially, like, when, again, we get the more training, more tournaments, more people down there. It's, it's going to be a matter of time before there's a lot more Canadian guys getting more recognition, for sure. Yeah especially because Toronto is such a big city. So there's, you have such a wide variety of like training partners and gyms and different styles to encounter. It's only, it's only, it's a matter of time before Toronto becomes like, I think like a big BJJ hub, just because of all the people that are moving there. I think it's yeah, already, I think it's, a- it's already starting. I, I think as well, like I think the level of jujitsu has really picked up the last few years as well. I think it's just a matter of time before you start seeing, you're seeing a lot of no gi world champions, yeah. Uh, especially in the in, in nogi, but then in the gi, you're starting to see a lot more. You'll, I think, you'll start seeing more like purple belt world champions and you know brown belt world champions, male and female. You'll see a lot more talent, yeah. I think, coming through. We've got the talent. We've got this. it's going to happen. 100. percent So, uh, Max, what are some like uh, dream matches other than uh, this other guy that call you had to call out? Oh, uh, I, I would like to fight Andrew Tackett because uh, so Andrew Tackett I have a lot of respect for his game I have a lot of respect for him uh when I flew out to Austin originally I actually he like told me that like he agreed to a match for fight to win and I think it was just some miscommunication like he didn't have any control of it uh, I think the matchmaker just decided nah this guy isn't known enough that guy being me I stayed an extra week there just to compete <laughs> like I, I competed mm-hmm. the fight to win and then I messaged Tackett like let's have a match man I'm in town like, I see you're looking for opponent. Like, let's go. And he's like, yeah, man, I'm down. So I really hope to have a match with him. I think he's an upcoming talent. That's going to be, like, really tough. Really, really tough. Like, William Tackett's already showed how tough he is. I know for a fact Andrew Tackett's going to be real good. At that fight to win that I competed at, he, uh, I'm pretty sure he submitted, like, a world champion pretty easily. Pretty, pretty yeah, easy. he's a really good, like young, up and coming guy. And what it, what you're starting to see is like, the, like for example, like the Rotulo twins, guys that have been training since they're like five or six years old. Yeah. Now they're becoming grown ass men, and they're going to start wrecking <laughs> shop when it comes to. And like those two, like uh, uh, Michael Galvao in in Brazil, oh, yeah. for example, is another big one as well. Where like he's. 17 18 and a brown belt and just absolutely just manhandling grown men. Man. those guys are going to be way better than anything we got now like if people think there's good uh, guys in jiu-jitsu now it's like just wait we have so much exposure to to training videos due to bjj fanatics and 
there's so much more knowledge in jiu-jitsu and exposure. I think those guys you're listing, mm-hmm. like the like Alvaos, Rotolos, uh, the Tackets, like any of those young buffs, like uh, Colabate, he's going to be a – that kid's yeah. going to be a man, 100%. Like those yeah. are the guys who want to fight. Like, I, honestly, I give a fuck about those guys already on their way out. Like I want to fight like the up-and-comers. I want to see what their game's like, their mentality, like how, how they're playing their matches. Because I know for a fact once I'm black belt, those are going to be – the, the number one competition for me. Yes, absolutely. I think so as well. Last question this evening. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about your favorite city, Windsor, Ontario. And uh, as a follow-up, what, you know, what do you like about it? And what is some of the worst areas in Windsor and in Ontario in general that uh, you've, you've seen? Uh, okay. Some things I like about Windsor for sure. Right off the top of my head, man, there's a restaurant called Windsor Penalty Box. Windsor Penalty Box. Okay, I do work there, so shout out, <laughs> shout out, Windsor shout Penalty out, yeah. Box. Shout You're getting a that. free shout out, Choking Hazard Podcast. <laughs> yeah, seriously, but man, uh, they're they're it's like the food's so good, man. Like best gyros on the planet, bro. Like I just had some food there, so my brother got me takeout. Like the best food you're gonna have, man. I I just telling you, like visit this restaurant, man. It's it's like historic restaurant in Windsor, one of the busiest restaurants in Windsor. Like definitely, if you're in Windsor, you have to visit this restaurant. Uh, some of the bad places in Windsor, man, uh, there's not a lot to see in Windsor, bro. Like I hate to, to shit on my own city, but there's a reason <laughs> I just spend most of my time training in garages, right? It's like, I ain't doing much if it's not training. Like, I guess we have a lot of strip clubs, bro, but like, shit. shout out Caesars Palace, Windsor. <laughs> shout out Caesars, bro. Shout out Caesars. Leopards, leopards, not bad. Cheetahs. <laughs> leopards cheetahs whatever uh anal- animals you have there uh i i usually like to play a a, a quick kill fuck mary so windsor yeah. hamilton brampton you have to kill one fuck one marry one Go. oh shit okay i gotta marry windsor uh i'm gonna fuck hamilton and i'm gonna kill brampton <laughs> everybody <laughs> always kills brampton <laughs> oh, fuck. bro come on that's a gift that's a good <laughs> kill Brampton. I'm like, I'm from Brampton and I would kill Brampton. So yeah, there you go, I, I take zero offense to that. Awesome. Hey, Max, is there any uh, sponsors you want to shout out to before we wrap up? No, man, I don't got any sponsors right now. Uh, I will say shout out. Anyone wants to sponsor me, send me a message. Uh, I used to have some supplement uh, sponsorships, but again, I've been kind of focused on competition so if any sponsors listen to this and are interested in uh, setting up a little deal, uh, just send me a message on Instagram. Maybe oh, shout out to TJ Laramie. TJ, get your ass to training, bro. What the fuck, man? You're stepping out. Let's train at least two times a day, three times a day. You're a UFC fighter, man. Let's go. I'm calling you out. Okay. Shout out to TJ as well. Uh, getting shout the, getting, out. Getting that UFC money. <laughs> No, that's for sure. Max, it's been a great time talking to you today. I really do appreciate you hopping on. Uh, we definitely want to come down to Windsor when everything kind of settles down and you get out of isolation and then we'll figure yeah. out a time to train. Yeah, for sure, man. Come on down whenever you guys are able to. Be happy to have you get some training in. And then maybe Absolutely. we'll go to the, and then, and then we'll go to Cheetahs after. Yeah. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, bro. We, we can find cleaner places. We find, we find cleaner, cleaner places. places. <laughs> Ones that maybe don't, and we're not talking about COVID, right? No, bro. Worst things than COVID. <laughs> there's the worst things than like, COVID. Beast, we're, like, we're gonna need some hospital grade disinfectant when we're done. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thank Max. You. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. Thank you.